Hello, welcome to Key News. I'm Jim Lusco, the Executive Director of Amherst Media. Today I'm really pleased to bring back an old friend, uh, a production a producer of a documentary a few years ago in 2012 that was done out of here in conjunction with his work up in the, uh, in the North Adams State College at the time, Maynard. Maynard Cedar, welcome back to Amherst Media. It's, it's great to be here. Some very, very good memories here when we produced the film. Yeah, and what was the name of that film again? Farewell to Factory Towns. Oh, yeah. And I've heard you've really produced that around the country, showing it at a lot of film festivals. And... I, I did. I mean, what I found out that there are probably thousands of film festivals. And so I entered a bunch sort of a little bit under the radar and met some good people and got to show the film. Well, I, w I was really pleased when you were able to finish that because it was a labor of love for sure on your part. Thank you, yeah. And today we're here because you've now taken a lot of your work that you used both in the documentary and your 32 years of teaching up at what was then the State College of North Adams, I believe. But it was first, it was, well, it has a long history, but when I started it was North Adams State College. Then it became Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts, MCLA. Okay. And so in that 32 years, I mean, you taught sociology, you were part of that community, and um, before we get into that, I want to mention that your new book, The Gritty Berkshires, A People's History from the Hoosick Tunnel to Mass Mocha, mm -hmm. is really, I've only been able to go through cha a few chapters, I'm um, really finding it extremely uh, informative uh -huh. and so reflective of the other New England towns and cities that were built by a, a river, by a waterway. You want right. to talk about that a little? Yeah, well, um, I mean, in a way, I mean, the, the title, the Gritty Berkshires, to many people would be an oxymoron because mm -hmm. people from outside of the Berkshires and even people living in some parts of the Berkshires don't see the Berkshires that way. They see it as a vacation land. They see it as Jacob's Pillow. They see it as the Boston Symphony. They see it as theater. And they don't know that uh, really significant parts of it, not just the North Berkshires, where I focus on, really are sort of Rust Belt, Rust Belt, Rust Belt areas. And the Hoosick River, on which North Adams is, is located, was a key reason for industry to be built up in that, in that area, just as in, in Pittsfield, the Housatonic River. Was a, was a key factor there as well. So in the early years, I was reading that um, it, it started off with cotton, mm -hmm. uh, both in woolen, mm -hmm. cotton, textiles, and shoes, mm -hmm. uh, which people forget New England was a major shoe manufacturer right. for a long time. Who are some of the people that were coming in? Well, um, there were large numbers of, of immigrants coming in, Catholic immigrants coming in from, from Ireland, from Italy, from Wales, from uh, French Canada, uh, from Poland, Jewish immigrants coming in from the Russian Empire. And they were coming into an area that was settled, you know, by the English, settled by mostly, by mostly, uh, by mostly Protestants, who, if we go way back, of course, were in many cases taking land away from, from the Native Americans who were living, who were living there. I mean, um, you mentioned you mentioned cotton, and when I first got the job at, at North Adams, I had no idea that the mills were there. And I remember driving, I think I was living in Amherst at the time, driving up from Amherst to North Adams and taking sort of a long way and going through the town of Adams, which is just south of mm -hmm. North Adams. And there in front of me was a statue of William McKinley. And I thought, McKinley? I mean, I've seen statues of, of Washington, of Lincoln, but why McKinley? And it turned out that it, it wasn't because of, you know, taking over Cuba and Puerto Rico and Hawaii and all the rest. It was because McKinley, when he was in Congress before he was president, was a big backer of a tariff. And the tariff helped the gentry, the elites in, in Adams and other parts around there, uh, get their cotton mills going because they were able to produce clothing that they would have been in great competition with the British if that weren't, if that wasn't there. So you, I totally understand that why McKinley, I mean, uh, he did do a lot of trips through New England and he seemed to always go to these towns. Right. They had large factory towns, the, right. the Holyoaks, the Lawrences, the Adams back in the day. Um, there was also, you know, a, a misconception 
I think still to this day that New England states were not involved with the slavery uh, history of the United States. That right. was a southern thing versus, and I think there was a quote in here I saw where it was like it, was, it went from the lash to the loom, mm -hmm. meaning that the connection to the cotton was so important. It was, and again, I was probably naive growing up in Connecticut. We were always taught that we were the good guys, they were the bad guys. And uh, the, the more I looked into that history, the more you see those particular kinds of, uh, kinds of connections. William C. Plunkett, who was the, the first Plunkett to get involved with producing uh, cotton garments in, uh, in Adams, was also very much involved in politics. And in 1854, he was lieutenant governor of the state of Massachusetts, and the fugitive slave law was very much in effect during that time. And he was lieutenant governor when, in a very important case, a former slave who already lived in Boston, Anthony Burns, was captured. And while Plunkett was lieutenant governor, he was sent back to, he was sent back to slavery. Mm. And, you know, the Whig party at that time was very much uh, divided mm. between the cotton Whigs and the more progressive Whigs. And obviously Plunkett was, was a cotton wig, as were the other big manufacturers in, in Massachusetts. And one thing I, I don't really know the reason for, because the people back in Adams, when there were votes, they were very anti-slavery. But mm -hmm. William C. Plunkett was obviously supporting slavery. Though after 54, the Whig Party basically dissolved. They basically were no longer, uh, no longer a force in politics. But the, the underbelly had already been established within that uh, oh, work, the, the class, if you will, between the, the owners and the workers. Absolutely. And, and what you find, and you probably know this being in this, in this area, it was not uncommon during that time for even ministers to have slaves sure. in this area. And um, the founder of Williams College, of Fryam Williams, had three slaves. Mm -hmm. And in his will, he left his fortune, including the slaves, to his family and what was left over to start a new school in what became Williamstown. And so the founding of Williams College really was based to some extent on, on slavery. So yeah, New England yeah. was very much very much tied into uh, into the into the southern. Yeah, we don't system. want to start naming names, but a lot of the colleges throughout New England have a long history to slave trade. Right. Um, what are the major uh, moments in the history of the area that you write so magnificently about in such detail? Is the building of what was called the Big Dig Big Dig of its day, meaning the Hoos Hoosick Tunnel? Right. And you know what was the rationale for that project? And can you give some background? Yeah, there were manufacturers in the east and Fitchburg, and even further east than that, that wanted an opening to the Midwest, into the markets in the Midwest. And uh, as they saw it from, let's say, the Fitchburg area and so on, just going directly to the west would have to go through the north, the North Berkshires, and the Hoosick Range stood in its way. So they got money from the legislature and other investors as well to try to dig a tunnel through the Hoosick Range that would open up, go towards Albany and further and further west. And it was a project that had all kinds of obstacles, just like the Big Dig in, in Boston did. And it's almost five miles long. It was finally finished. Perhaps as many as 195 men died in the building in, in the building of that tunnel. And it wasn't finished until the late 70s, 1870s. And by the time it was finished, there were other paths to the Midwest. So it didn't really establish the kind of renaissance, economic renaissance that people were hoping for. But it was a way that the freight trains went through and there was passenger service also. Well, up to that point, it was it, to get the goods from New England, uh, Boston area, shall we say, had to go all the way down on the route by the by the seashore, come up back up through the Springfield, the Connecticut River Valley. Right. There was, I mean, there was some through Worcester. It was really, this was an opportunity they thought to bring it quicker over to the Albany market and beyond in 
more importantly, bringing the Midwest right. goods it, coming to East. Right. It was a, it went, right. It would go both ways, right. obviously. Right. And that, I read in your book is the um, about 125 trains a day were going through that tunnel at its peak. Right. Is, right. For, I mean, for us today, that's just unheard of. Right. Not only the trains, but in the 25 years or so of building the tunnel, they talk about North Adams and Florida Mountain as almost being a frontier town, yeah. because there were people living in shanty towns. Uh, mostly, uh, mostly men. It was very, very difficult work. There were strikes from time to time, and um, the thing was finally done. But as I said, when it was finally done, it, it didn't really right. bring what people had hoped it would. Matter of fact, I think I read in the book where it hurt some of the factories in the Williamstown area right. because the goods, the cotton goods, were coming in cheaper from right. Boston into the immediate area. So. All, all great plans. Right, but little collateral damage. Yeah. Collateral damage, but the amount of individuals who lost their lives building that, uh, you mentioned 195. Right. Is, um, is there a monument to them? Is there... There, are, there are a couple of memorial, there's a memorial stone in North Adams, and there's a memorial stone or two on Florida Mountain, mm -hmm. which is sort of the, the high point of the, uh, of the, terrain, of the terrain there. But there's no statue. Okay. There's no statue to the men who lost their lives. And one of the problems with some of the history that's been done, it really hasn't been a social history of the workers of the Hoosick Tunnel. There's been technological, there's been economic, there's been political. But as far as knowing a lot about the daily lives of those men and what the work was like, there are bits and pieces, but no real concerted, deep effort to really find all that out. And in fact, in some cases, we don't know all the names of the men. And one of the things that I was gratified to find out when I was in North Adams is that there's a, a local historian, a man named Chuck Cahoon, who's made it his business. He's now head of the North Adams Historical Society. He's made it his business to try to find out the name of every one of those men who died. And he's still working on that project just to give him the dignity of a name as opposed to an Irishman right, died right. last night or something like and, that. And the records would be the transcript was the newspaper of note there at the time, I think. Right, and he would go to death notices right. and things like that. Uh -huh. But it would be a worker died versus right. the name of the worker. Right. right. Um, the other part that another issue I found really interesting was that it was a shoe manufacturing town. I tend to think of Lynn and other mm -hmm. uh, cities and towns in the eastern part of the state more for shoes, but and that it became a, a labor uh, movement, part mm -hmm. of the, the Knights of St. Crispin. Mm -hmm. And you know, they could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, they were mostly French Canadian workers in, in North Adams. A lot of people came down to Holyoke and also North Adams during that period of time trying to, to make a living. The things were tough up in, up, up in Quebec. And um, they worked for a major manufacturer named, uh, named Samson. And uh, they, were, uh, they were very strong men. They were fighting for their, for their rights, for their dignity, for their wages. They often went out on strike. Samson would bring in outsiders, but the workers would keep them from working or they would convince them not to work. And finally, what Samson did, it was sort of an historic moment. He sent his foreman by train to California, and he came back to North Adams with 75 young Chinese men to work in the factory. I think many of them probably didn't know they were brought to be strike breakers, and he had a contract with them for three years. So you have a spectacle in North Adams where people in the community are down by the train station waiting for these 75 young men to come. Many of them had probably never even seen anyone from China right. or from Asia. And it was actually a very nonviolent greeting. It was mostly people just sort of in awe of what they're, of what they're saying. As you say, the young uh, Chinese men did not realize they were contracted. Right. It was a three-year contract, 11-hour days right. they were contracted for. So that was quite right. a, a how do you do. Going to your background, going jumping ahead now to 1978, you arrive in North Adams to start right. teaching sociology right. at the college. How did you get involved with the community? I'm, I'm assuming that you, you, you embraced and got out there and started meeting yeah, people. Yeah, well, my, I mean, I grew up in a union family. My dad was a union post, postal worker. Okay. My mom was a seamstress, I-O-G-W-U. And I was always interested and supportive of unions. 
and um, Sprague Electric Company, which was the dominant industry in the late 70s when I was there, was still, still going strong. And the thing about being at a small college in a relatively small community, it's possible to sort of get an overview of the community. It's not like being in New York sure. or Detroit yeah. or something like that. So I became very interested in the people who were working there. And many of them were the children uh, of the workers were my students. So they were interested in the community as well. And so I began to have classes where students would do oral histories, where students would, let's say, be interns at some of the places where their parents, where their parents worked. And I just got more and more interested in, in, in doing that and in trying to trace the history that brought us to that particular moment. Yeah, I, the oral history is so important because, as you pointed out earlier, the written documentation of the workforce right. is not there in the typical way of, the, of other writings, meaning they're a figure. You know, they were how much was spent by the, the industrialist or right. how many people were sick or what the strike was, the need. So getting families to even recognize their own history and to, to celebrate their history by asking their elders right. is very informative. It is, and in, in the late 80s, there was a project throughout Massachusetts called Shifting Gears, mm. and it was a project that was put in every Heritage State Park in the state. So, for example, Holyoke had yeah. one, North Adams had one, and they had money available to hire professional historians who would then do oral histories in the community. So the, the, the historians in North Adams would also work with middle school and high school kids. And they would train them to do oral histories, often of their parents and grandparents. Yeah. And those transcripts are available. University of Massachusetts at Lowell has those transcripts available. Good to know. People so, should know that. And so what you find out is not only what was life like working at Sprague Electric, but these were folks who were that time maybe in their 60s and 70s, so they also talked about growing up in the 30s during the Depression. What their parents did, yeah. So you have that material yeah. as well. Jumping ahead from Sprague, I mean, I know they made a lot of the electrical wiring was tied into the war effort, mm -hmm. Vietnam War, and the military in general. In 70, it was 85 when they finally closed or started moving right. big time out of the... Right. What did that do in devastating terms to the... Well, um, Sprague was always, always had a lot of foresight in terms of having plants outside of North Adams, mm. uh, in the South, in Europe, in the, in the Caribbean. And um, in, the early, in the early 70s, Sprague was sold to a couple of other companies, the last one being Penn Central. Okay. And Penn Central at that time was just really interested in, in milking those companies and then getting rid of them. So basically, in 85, 86, Sprague Electric closed. North Adams was devastated. Unemployment rate was, uh, was really high. Up 35%, I think, if I remember correctly. It was, it was one, of the, yeah. one, of the highest, one of the highest in the state. And so then the next question becomes, what's next? Which is sort of a question that a lot of factory towns yeah. had to deal with. And what did come next? <laughs> well, what came, what came next was uh, a huge museum which still exists very much so in North Adams, Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art. and Known as MOCA. Known as MOCA, right. And um, the idea for it came from uh, a guy who was running the Williams College Museum of Art, a man named Thomas Krenz, who later became associated with the Guggenheim. And he saw those, those huge buildings, mm -hmm. really a, a campus of more than 20 buildings where Sprague Electric mm -hmm. was, was Arnold Print Works, and he saw it, I think, originally as a place where they might store some yeah. of the art that they couldn't fit into the Guggenheim Museum in New York, but it then ultimately became a museum. Governor Dukakis at the time liked the idea, and the legislature gave $35 million to start the museum. Well, I know in your documentary you touched on that a lot, mm -hmm. Farewell to Factory Tom, the promises made of jobs. Right. and. And it doesn't appear to that it's really benefited everyone. Uh, and some people have come in and take advantage of that new, the new life that it's bringing to that town. But it also ties it back into the Berkshires, as you mentioned in the very beginning, that's not gritty. You know, it's part right. of that art world or that. Right. I mean, one of the things that the museum has done, we talked about, you asked a question about immigrants earlier. Yeah. So in a way, it has brought in a number of artists to the community. So in a sense, the new immigrant group uh, are the artists. 
and some of them have gotten involved with the community and they brought in sort of new ideas which is which has been great what what hasn't happened is the museum hasn't produced the number of good quality jobs that they promised it would produce and a lot of people who go to the museum don't spend money on Main Street. Right. They just get in their car and they go elsewhere. As, as most like malls or casinos, shall I say, do the same thing to right. towns and cities. Exactly. And you said there's another project on the board, the planning board right now by the same gentleman, right? Right. Thomas Krenz is now done with the Guggenheim. He lives in Williamstown and he's got plans for four or five museums in North Adams and the biggest one is what he calls an extreme model railway museum based on a museum that he saw in uh, in Hamburg, Germany. Okay. And he's got an architect lined up. He's trying to get investors for it. And if it happens, the economist who does that kind of figuring thinks there might be as many as three quarter of a million tourists coming to North Adams to see MOCA and also this extreme model railway museum. And I should say, while they'll be coming to see extreme model railway, there's no passenger service into North Adams. So they'd have to be coming by car, and that's a whole environmental question that really has to be dealt with. Absolutely, and one that people seem to be getting more and more aware that this is a real issue. Right. And you know, if we're not gonna provide public transportation right. in a better, meaningful way. So we have uh, about five minutes left or so. Sure. I wanted to um, ask you about your other work. You're, you're not living in the area anymore. Right. You're on a tour with your book. You just recently had a, weren't you up in North Adams for your first uh, book reading? Right, about a week and a half ago, we had the book lunch in, uh, in North Adams, and we had a wonderful uh, local folk music group called Wintergreen that actually did the did the, yeah. music, the music for, for, the, 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 music for, the, for the documentary. And uh, it was just a wonderful group. We had about 75 people. Oh, wow. We had a really good time. Uh, I did another book launch uh, the next day in, in Leverett, Massachusetts. And um, one of the nice things about having the book and trying to sell the book is it gave me an opportunity to ride all around the Berkshires and Southern Vermont to bookstores and to uh, talk to them about yeah. taking the book on consignment. Well, I know we have a couple bookstores in the immediate area that you probably should try to get into. I, I already have. Oh! Amherst Books and also Broadside. Nice. And um, the one in South Hadley. Odyssey? Odyssey, right. Joan Ari has you over there? Yeah. Um, I don't know why I can't think of the name. Honestly, my son teaches classics that should come to mind right away. But anyway, I was well, blanking on that. Uh, Joan and John, John, who was involved with Jobs for Justice forever, yeah. and I'm sure you both know each other. He, he blurbed the book. He blurbed the book. Yeah. And I got to say, for people, you, I really find that it's a book you can pick up and start at any point because mm -hmm. it's so rich and it, and it really, you, 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 you tell it in a very accessible way. And, I, and that's not, uh, I'm not, that's not putting it down. Mm -hmm. It's saying that I immediately want to know more. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you look at the details through the eyes of someone that cares about the working class. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's not that common. That you're even uh, referred to as uh, Howard Zinn, being likened to Howard Zinn is quite a compliment. Mm -hmm. And I think it's deserving. And I really, I really congratulate you. This has been a life work of yours, right. from teaching all the way to the documentary to now the book and the previous book. Um, so what, what's next for you? I mean, where, where are you going from here? Well, it's an interesting question. Um, my wife is a writer. She's a poet. And uh, I'm there with 100 books and looking for endnotes and footnotes and so on. And she's creating this beautiful poetry. And I'm a little bit jealous of that. <laughs> it gets done a little quicker, is it? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit quicker, and a little bit less obsessively. So I, I'm not really, I'm not really sure. I mean, one of the things that I really hope for the book is that it will be in local libraries, it'll be in local schools, it'll be in local colleges, and young people this year, next year, will pick up, read a chapter, and they'll become interested in it and they'll do some of the digging that still, still needs to be done. One of the problems that I found in talking to teachers is they have very little time, unfortunately, to do True. local history. There's yeah. so many demands on them with the, you know, with the test, standardized yeah. testing and so on. So, um, but that's really my ultimate hope for the book. 
Well, I am also hopeful in that you're, you're touching upon so much of what m the initial immigration of different people into this mm -hmm. country mm -hmm. and, how, and who made the things that we right. came to use and right. need. And right now we have such a, a backlash towards immigrants from our political leader. That's true. And I think it's important for people that they forget. I mean, I don't care who you talk to in this country, unless they're a Native American. Right. There's, they are all immigrants. Right. You know, and and as soon as we have to get people to understand that. Right. You might have been here two, three generations, but your family was still an immigrant family in this point. Absolutely right. So they could see how this country was built on the backs and the labor of immigrants. Yeah. And right? it wasn't always pretty by any means. Not but, at all. Know. No. And that's what I love about the grittiness of this, the gritty Berkshires. Uh, people's history from the Hoosick Tunnel to Mass Mocha, uh, Maynard's Cedar. You've done a great job and a service for everybody. It's not just a North Adams story, it's an American story, and I thank you for it. Well, thank you, Jim. And so, best of luck with it as you travel around the, the country. I hope people pick it up. Okay, thank you very much. It's great being here. That's great having you here. Thank you.